Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start, and people can wander in as they come in. Um, this is a session on aging in Fragile X, but really it's about adult issues, meaning aging past childhood, because what we know about true aging is very, is very limited. Um, so um, during this session, I'm going to cover a variety of topics, which I've sort of pulled from various places, and I think um, this session may um, almost emphasize what we, what we don't know about adults with Fragile X and why we need to know more. Um, so I'm going to try to go over what we do know. And um, so some of this I have from Marsha Braden when, the, when uh, a session was run about um, issues that adults have at a previous meeting, and some of it comes from other places and from our clinic. Um, and we're going to, I'm just going to try to run through the slides and then we can have kind of a question and answer session at the end. So um, adult issues. So there's a list of issues that impact behavior. Oops. All right. So now this time I'm going to keep myself in sync. Um, so the, uh, adult, the, the adult issues include things like physical ailments and medical problems, the cognitive deficits and how those play a role in what the adult is doing. Um, speech and language delays, sensory integration dysfunction, gross and fine motor delays, and social impairments. And these are really similar categories as the children have, but there's kind of a changing profile um, in, in, as patients become older. Um, and so these are some of the key issues. And um, I think um, one of the, the, this is the recent voice of the patient survey that we did out of the National Fragile X Foundation in conjunction with, Ful with Fulcrum. Uh, and Jane Dixon Weber really, you know, was key in leading this. And this, this, um, this survey really does illustrate that issues change, and there's things that are more important to adult in adult life than in um, child life. Um, so I showed this in in my one of my other talks. But there were 468 responders. And these were all families of individuals with fragile X. Although there were a few um, full mutation females who responded on their own. Um, and really, um, the survey, the point of the survey was to identify the, the top three areas of daily life that the person with Fragile X was most affected with. And what we came out with over the entire group is um, issues with speech, uh, learning, academics, and um, behavioral issues. Um, so we had a lot of respondents in this survey, uh, and I'm not showing you the right slide again, because I can't keep my fingers straight here. Um, so we had a lot of respondents in the survey. There were actually um, there were actually plenty of respondents who were over 22 years of age. So we had a good cohort of people responding, um, and there was a somewhat different profile in what people were interested in based on age, suggesting that what's important to families does change with age, which uh, one would expect. So things like speech were most important in very young kids, and then um, anxiety and learning in, in kids who are school age. Um, and then as patients got older, um, you started to have uh, more issues with, with um, anxiety playing a bigger role. And then by the time, so really, in terms of the adults, the males who are over 22 years of age, um, social anxiety was starting to play a, a significant role as well as generalized anxiety and then issues with learning, which of course are a problem throughout the lifespan in Fragile X. Um, so, um, and this was, this was again was a, just a, a information across the board. One of the things that pharmaceutical companies often ask us is, what are what our families most interested in behavior or cognition what's the what's the key problem in fragile x and so when we actually surveyed a whole bunch of families um, learning comes out slightly higher than anxiety but anxiety is right up there and actually um, you know in the in the females it's more even with learning um, so um, i'm going to use this kind of as a takeoff to talk about um, a variety of different adult issues. So the first category of issues I'm going to talk about is behavioral and social issues. Um, and I think we start to see 
Um, right from the beginning of when people are transitioning to adulthood, we see sometimes more difficult behavior just because things are changing and life is in flux. Um, when patients are going from high school to transition program and then from a transition program to a job, this is a big change. You know, you go through school and you've got sort of 12 years of doing about the same thing and going to school, but now things are going to change. Um, and you can have more anxiety and aggression before things kind of settle in. Um, in adulthood, and this is actually something that typical adolescents go through as they transition into life. It's just more amplified in Fragile X because there's more confusion about what the patient is actually doing and what's going on as people become adults, and, and the patients can't really voice the problem and discuss it as well as, as you know, typically developing individuals. Um, we know that the types of behavior change as people become adults because the medications we use also change. Um, and so um, this, is, this is one of Don Bailey's surveys that shows that medications for individuals with a, for attention and hyperactivity are used a lot during childhood, but then those go down. But we continue to use a lot of medications for um, things like anxiety and aggression. And this is an old survey from my clinic and Randy's that shows that mostly we use attentions, attention medicines or stimulants in kids, and then we use a lot of anxiety medicines and antipsychotics in, in patients who are over 18. And why is that? That's because the, the types of behavior that are most important in kids, like the attention span and the hyperactivity, you know, are no longer the key behaviors in adults. It's not that, they're, it's not that those symptoms go away. It's just that the biggest problem behaviors become more of the anxiety and, and sometimes aggression or outbursts. Um, and another problem, this is a slide I like to show at, at lots of uh, talks about medications and talks about adults, is that when we look at the use of medication, it goes up with age, and we look at the services um, that people get. So people don't get OT and speech therapy and behavioral therapy and all of the all those things that we get during childhood. We don't patients who are adults often don't get those services unless the family can pay for a lot of services. So um, what's happening? is really that we're relying mainly on medication to manage behavior and not really thinking anymore about implementing some kind of a behavioral plan. Um, and we have to work with you know, residential placements and, and group homes all the time on you know, the concept that behavior is not just controlled by medication. And in fact, sometimes medication won't even work for a type of behavior that we also have to use. Uh, we have to implement strategies and therapies and plans. Um, there is this phenomenon that I've seen in a few patients um, in my clinic, which is this kind of adolescent early adult regression where the patient kind of sometime during the teenage years or early 20s has a loss of interest in all the things they really used to like. Um, the patient may be more reclusive and may not want to talk to anybody. They may seem sluggish. They may even exhibit some bizarre behavior um, and really have a lack of interest in doing anything with people. This is a very small percentage of patients, but I think that this exists and it's kind of a, it's almost a schizophrenia-like regression that the patients can sometimes get um, at the end of the teenage years and early 20s. And it's really like what happens in typical individuals developing schizophrenia. And of course, um, schizophrenia is seen as, it's, it's, psychotic changes in schizophrenia are seen, seen at a certain percentage in the population. So of course we expect that we might see that in a certain percentage of Fragile X and Downs patients and patients with Phelan McDermott syndrome and other developmental disabilities. So it's not just Fragile X we see this in. We see this across the board in all developmental disabilities. And I don't think we know whether Fragile X, having Fragile X, for instance, makes you more likely to have that kind of, of regression or whether this is just the population frequency of, of that kind of a problem that's superimposed on having fragile X. All right. Um, so behavioral issues that can emerge in adults. Well, you know, obviously all these things can be seen in kids, but this is kind of things that are, that, that become a little more evident in adults. So mood disorders, problems with, you know, kinds of ups and downs in moods. I mean, difficulty being able to sit for a long time is also a problem in kids. Um, pacing, issues with sleep may be a problem early on and then they may reemerge as patients become adults. Irritability. Um, one, does, one can see depression, like a loss of interest in favorite activities, lack of 
appetite, and that's to be distinguished from this psychotic-like regression where the patient just doesn't want to do anything. But you can sometimes see patients who really are depressed, especially around the time of transition, where they, they've been in inclusion and all of their friends are going off to college, and they kind of don't know what they're doing, and they're kind of lost in life. And I have seen this with a number of especially higher and moderate functioning patients with fragile X who really seem to recognize there's something going on that's changing for everybody, but, but they're not part of it, and they don't quite get, you know, what their role is. And so we have, I have actually had to treat a reactive depression in some of the older teenagers with fragile X as the transition period has come on. Um, panic episodes, these kind of episodes when the patient just completely loses it. Um, the patient may look flushed and frightened, they may try to get away, they may breathe rapidly or sweat heavily or have a rapid pulse rate. Um, and we can, we can definitely see panic episodes and we often see them in a setting where the patient clearly doesn't want to be, um, but they're kind of being stuck there. You know, I have numerous examples of um, patient lives, you know, is, is out in a community program or, or lives in a group home and they have to go on the bus and the bus is crowded and the bus is unpleasant and the patient says, I can't be on this bus, I have to leave and the, care, the, the, the program says, well, you have to stay on the bus and then we suddenly, you know, a few, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, we suddenly have an outburst and there were all these signs ahead of time that this was going to happen but, um, but this wasn't right. Recognized. So we see these kind of episodes, and especially when patients are closed in and they're kind of stuck doing something that is really very overwhelming for them. Um, and I, I do think that some of the patients, as they go into adulthood, have an increased um, self-awareness of, of their own condition, and I think even that can sometimes cause sort of depressive episodes. Um, resistance. Is, is obviously a key issue in adults with fragile X. So some of the adults have grown up and they've kind of learned that certain things are difficult and that they don't like certain things and they don't want to do those things and then they tend to resist this. And particularly if they have social difficulties and they don't like to be faced with social situations and they don't, they'd rather not be at a social event. They don't like being with people they don't know and they don't want to take social risks. Um, they increasingly become kind of resistant to doing um, social activities. Um, there can also be this frustration with different tasks. Again, the patient has grown up and they have learned, they've had, they've had years of learning that learning is hard. And then you're going to try to teach them something, and if they really don't want to have to focus and learn, then that can be very frustrating and there can be a resistance to doing that. Um, and then the other thing is that they may be kind of stuck doing something that they don't really like. Because of having the cognitive deficits, this limits work choices. You know, when a typical child grows up, they look at everything in college and what kind of thing would they like to do in their life, and they get to choose to some extent. Some of the fragile X patients are not really getting to choose. They're going to work at the grocery store. They're, they're going to go to wherever the program has a connection, for instance, with, um, with, with a work environment environment and the patient may not like that kind of work and then or they may be bored they may be at a um, at a workshop where there's no work to do so they're sitting around all day so um, I, I personally think that finding a match to what the patient wants to do is a tremendous help in terms of managing behavior because we get a lot of resistance to doing things that we don't want to do um, so resistance, refusals, oppositionality, reluctance, these kinds of things lead to escape behaviors and aggression. Um, and again, this is a combination of the biology predisposing to these types of behaviors as well as frustration because of um, learning that you're not, you know, that things are difficult and that because of your limitations you might not get to do what you want to do. Um, so um, there, at the Fragile X conference in 2014, there was a list that came out that was, was generated, and Marsha Braden shared this with me, of things that, patient, that adults with Fragile X resist. And it's, it's, the, it's, it's a big list of things that you can recognize we commonly see in individuals with Fragile X. A new routine, an unexpected change, having to meet new people, having to make new social contacts, uh, getting on the phone and talking, um, doing chores or jobs, Driving, patients who are high fun some patients who are high functioning enough to drive are very nervous and don't want to learn to drive. Um, flying on a plane, uh, navigating and, and finding a place correctly, leaving the house, um, 
failing, you know, just I don't want to do this because I'm worried that I won't do it right. Um, making a mistake, being rushed, public speaking, these can all be things that, that individuals with fragile X can resist, but not, not, probably not every patient resists all of these things. It's, you know, it's kind of pick and choose depending on what the patient particularly is anxious about. Um, adult behavioral issues that from this kind of um, group were considered really problematic are things like being cranky and irritable, lying. Some patients don't lie at all, but there are some patients who do, and I've seen that in my clinic. Um, aggression and self-abuse, um, avoidance of things, obsessions, picking. Some of our patients have really difficult problems with picking, and they don't, oops, oops sorry. I have people, I have people now I have the, now the audience helping me advance slides, that's great. <laughs> Before I had Rondi, you know, poking me in the side, but. <laughs> um, so um, picking is really a problem um, for some of the patients. And it, it limits job opportunities because if you pick all the time and you have bleeding sores and you're working, you know, uh, in the laundry, that's not a good thing. So um, this can be very limiting. Laughing at inappropriate times, you know, that, that's kind of tolerated in kids, but it's less, you know, people look and think there's something odd with an adult and then they kind of don't want to be around you. Swearing, you know, becomes an increasing problem also with age. Um, so um, I think, and, and we see this a lot in our clinic, as adults get older, they're involved maybe in less activities, and maybe that's partly due to themselves, and they become agoraphobic, in a, uh, agoraphobic. in other words, they want to stay at home and they want to withdraw, and they're hard to get, it's hard to get them out of the house, and then it's hard to get them out of the bedroom. They become kind of increasingly reclusive. And I tell most of my adult families, if not all of them, that, I mean, some of them don't need it, because some of the guys really don't have this issue, but a lot of them do. And um, it's really important to keep them in the community. If they have to go out of the house every day, or multiple times a day, then it's less, it, it's, it's um, less likely that they're going to get to the point where they won't go out of the house. But if they get to stay home, you know, and this is especially true when people can't get into programs and they're just staying home every day, then they get harder and harder to push out of the house. So it's really important to keep that certain level of exposure going or otherwise you can get in a really difficult situation. Um, there's a subset of the population, this is not true for everyone, but becomes kind of more agitated and less tolerant and has more problems with aggression as they age. Um, psychiatric dysfunction, including anxiety and phobias, can be more common. And then there's also a subgroup that becomes more rigid and perseverative, where they get less things that they're interested in doing, and they want to do the same things over and over again, more so than they did when they were younger. Um, intermittent aggression. This is probably one of the biggest issues that we deal with in clinic. Why? Because people with this problem are in clinic because uh, everyone is having trouble handling it and there are always questions about what to do with medications. This is the situation where the patient is fine, they're engaging, they're sweet, they're lovable 99% of the time. And then there's a situation when the patient gets really agitated, and that may be because um, someone else in their group home was doing something to them, or it may be because they just didn't like the situation, or because they were on a bus when it was too hot, or whatever. Um, and they just get really agitated and build up and then have a violent tantrum and meltdown. And sometimes with the adults, they, they can be big and they can do physical damage to property and to people. And that becomes a real big interference with vocational and social activities because no one knows when it's going to happen. Now, there often are signs that it's going to happen, but what happens is those who are um, working with the patient often don't recognize the signs that it's going to happen, so they feel like this this is completely unpredictable. Um, and even for the experienced um, caseworker or whatever, this can be hard to predict. Um, there usually are war some warning signs, though. Um, so this can be very interfering. Um, medications can be helpful, like Abilify or Risperdal, 
but it's often hard to assess the effect of the, th of the medication. If the patient has a catastrophic outburst, like every three or four months, and I'm titrating medications, it's very hard to do because I have to have the patient on the medication for a very long time before I know whether it's making a significant impact on that kind of event. And the approach that I've seen in many of the programs is that every time there's an out the patient has an outburst every four months. Every time there's an outburst, everyone decides his medication isn't high enough. And then we raise the medication or we add a new medication. So if we do that every three, every three times a year for 20 years, then we get patients in clinic who are on seven medications at really high doses. And the problem is still not, basically not controlled unless the patient is so stoned they just can't do anything. So so this is really not a good approach to this problem. Um, and I think essentially um, when we're using medication for this, we're lowering the chance the patient will have an outburst. But if we get into a really aversive situation that the patient doesn't like, we are still going to have the outburst, no matter what medication we have the patient on. So the, 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 the better way to handle this when you have these very infrequent events is to have um, good observation, to know what the signs of agitation are, to have a behavior plan where the patient will get taken out of the situation or they'll learn to take themselves out so that we don't get to the point of having the big outburst. And, um, you know, so I think that's what doesn't get put in is, is often the behavioral plan that's, that's needed to work with the medication. Um, so this is a study they did in Finland of 37 adults with Fragile X. Oops, and I'm not on track again. Okay, um, and they looked at what happened. So they followed these people over, over a pretty long time, between 1994 and 2014, so that's 20 years, and looked at what really changed. And it seemed that eye contact decreased a little bit. A lot of things kind of stayed similar. Um, they saw more hand flapping later on. I can't say that I see hand flapping really increasing a lot. I see it more decreasing. You know, the young kids do a lot of it. Um, biting um, increased some as, as patients got older. Um, and then a lot of the things were kind of very, very similar. So behavior is pretty stable, um, at least over the 20 years that, that, these, um, uh, that these adults were followed. But, you know, it, it doesn't really look like it gets better, is the other conclusion. Um, so intervention, the interventions to promote independence and improve social behavioral functioning are really important. Um, medications can help, but, but behavioral interventions, uh, social interventions, training makes, makes a huge difference. And so having a variety of experiences within the home and the community helps um, reduce the tendency to have withdrawal and you know, provides the patient with ongoing experiences from which they can learn. Um, it's important to develop interests and things that make the patient more um, able to socialize because they have something to talk about. It's important to encourage social en engagement in small groups, sometimes if other groups are overwhelming, like church activities or scouting or clubs. And it's also important to encourage looking pretty normal, like age-appropriate dress um, and grooming and personal hygiene because no one wants to interact with somebody who you know, looks very disheveled, or especially if the person smells. Um, so these are just examples of groups that can promote socialization, church and youth groups, Special Olympics. A lot of our patients are in Special Olympics, and that's really important. Um, theater group, we have some patients who go out to movies. Choir or a musical group, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts is really a great thing, um, for even for some of the older patients when that works out. And then other volunteer groups can also be good. Um, other social activities, lots of different kind of sports activities, even just getting together with a couple of buddies and watching sports on TV, because a lot of our patients, adult patients, are really into their sports team, um, even some of the kids. Um, you know, horseback riding, um, music, bowling, we have patients that do karate. Um, and really, I think the incorporation of a fitness activity into every adult's life is very important. Um, I 
actually write prescriptions for that sometimes in clinic because the group home doesn't have a plan and sometimes if a doctor writes a prescription then they feel like they have to do it. So, um, so we encourage exercise 40 minutes a day at least five days a week just like the American Heart Association encourages. And the thing is, you know, if you're a, a typical adult and you're on your own, maybe you do this and maybe you don't, but you're making the choice to do that or not to do it. Whereas our patients with Fragile X are often, they're, they're not making, they're not really making the choice. They, they don't, they tend to not want to exercise just because it's one of those things that they don't want to do. But if you put it on a regular schedule and write it into a program, they, they'll, they'll do it, you know. And, and sometimes we can make it a habit where it happens every time of day at the same time. And then they perseverate on it, which is really good. So, um, so that helps to keep them in shape. But we have a lot of issues with with long-term weight gain and, and lack of good physical tone because of people not exercising. Um, so this is actually data from our clinic. We have 41, we have, we have 91 patients in the um, forward project. I have more adults than that. Some of them aren't in the forward project um, or they haven't come in within a time that we were collecting the data. And this is actually what our patients in clinic are actually doing. And it's kind of the number of patients who engage in these activities. So we have people who are doing special needs exercise activities, people who are People who are in some exercise program that's not a special needs exercise program. Um, people, a lot of patients who belong to a church group or some kind of organized social activity. Um, people who do park district recreation programs, um, which may be special needs ones or maybe um, maybe programs that just exist and they go to them. Um, there are some. I mean, these are adults, so school related activities are are pretty low because school is over and then we have a lot of patients who are who are involved in work and I think this is more work as a social activity i.e. Um, going out with individuals who are who, who they work with um, or an organized buddies program so these are all ways of of getting out there and socializing that are actually being used in our clinic but um, there's there I would say that given that we have 91 patients here and some of these people are doing several things, I, I think there's a fair number of people who, who aren't doing a lot. Um, and, and probably we could pack more activities into all these guys' lives. Um, so the amount of time people are spending in these activities. So I was really glad to see that, that we at least had you know, 20 or so patients who are doing more than 10 hours a week of some activity. But, you know, as you can see, there's a fair number of people who aren't doing a lot of the social activities. And again, this just is another um, suggest that we could have more programs and we could pack more time into, into a lot of these activities. Um, so, um, one of the things that's important is having appropriate behavior. And these are slides I got from Marsha. Her name is on them. Um, and Marsha is really the expert at all of at all of the uh, plant at all the the programs to teach teach pro social behavior. So you want to eliminate negative activities like un, inappropriate undressing and sexually explicit language or behaviors in public. Um, you have to really teach private and public behavior because that doesn't always come naturally to guys with fragile X. Um, model appropriate behaviors and begin early, you know, so that you're not trying to catch up when the, when the patient's 25. Um, using things like repetition to habituate appropriate behaviors, um, teaching advocacy, and participating in social skills groups where appropriate social behaviors can be demonstrated. Um, individuals with fragile X may not hold on to social concepts and rules real, real well if it's not, oops, all right, people are signaling me again. Um, may not hold on to social concepts and rules real, real well without a lot of reinforcement. So reteaching, reteaching of everything in Fragile X is important. I see adults who learn to read and who don't read as well when they're 30 or 35 because no one is, they, they aren't reading anymore. Um, and I think this is true also of social skills. Um, you can't expect to teach it once and okay, now he knows it. That's not gonna happen. It's an ongoing process of teaching it persistently um, throughout life. Um, Marsha has a social compass program, which is a very good program to work on some of these social events. Marsha is here, so I'm, I'm sure, and she, this, is, this information is all on her website. Um, 
And the social compass program works on social targets, meeting and greeting, ma manners, navigating sexuality, and then has a compass club activity. Um, and this is some of the things that you do, like where you can put pri pictures of private and public be behaviors on a board so patients can see, because visuals are always important in Fragile X, what's appropriate to do in public and what you only do when you're by yourself. Um, and then this is just a list of resources. Um, that people can use to, um, to look at social skills as well as, as job and community skills. Um, okay, guardianship. Um, I'm just, so, so that was kind of the behavioral section. I'm going to move on to talk about some other adult topics. Um, guardianship. Most adult Fragile X patients will need a guardian. Females are much more variable. Um, you can do partial guardianship or power of attorney in cases where you don't feel like you need to control everything. Um, I, I, I have a, a number of situations where a group home has asked the family to sign guardianship or power of attorney over to them. Um, I think unless you really have a sense they're working with you, that can be not a good idea. Once you sign guardianship over to a group home, you have no control over the medications that the patient is going to be on, and they can kind of do whatever they want, and I, I don't usually advise that. Um, some clinics will not see patients with intellectual disability. Your child turns to, is, it comes in at 19 to see you know, someone in clinic, and some, patients will, some clinics will not let you go back with that patient to the room unless the patient can give clear consent. And some patients just won't see, some clinics just won't see the patient because they perceive the patient's not capable of giving appropriate consent, but at the same time, they're their own guardian, so now they just won't see the patient because they're concerned about legal issues. We don't have that issue. We don't, we, we try to, you know, advise people that it would be a good idea to do something about this and at least get power of attorney um, because, but, but we don't refuse to see people. But I think um, having a guardian is important and having a long-term plan about who is going to be the guardian and the caregiver over the long-term, even when the parents are no longer around. Um, so um, let's talk about residents. Um, we know that um, lots of the patients live at home, and so this is actually data from our rush from our 91 patients in Forward at the Rush Clinic um, that shows that really. Uh, about 70% of the patients that we're seeing are still living at home with the parents. Um, the green is a group home, so that's a common setting. And then the purple is an independent, independent apartment or a house with support, and that's kind of a slightly different thing from a group home, but, but the, the lines are very blurry now that SILAs are the way that most of the um, group home organizations are going. We have very few patients who are in a, a formal residential setting. Um, and then we have some patients who are living with another family member that's not the parents. Um, I think, you know, many of the patients are not kind of ready to move out necessarily right when they finish high school or the transition program, for instance. But many of the guys I see who are 30 or 35, if they're still at home, they're, they're kind of ready to move out. All their friends have moved out. Nobody lives at home. Um, and I, I think it's appropriate there to, for them to be in the community with other individuals, living with other individuals who are their friends. And I, I, you know, and I think some of the, really the SILA-based, um, community-based life kind of plans are, are really good. And uh, of course, there are models where you can have apartments that are supervised by, um, by a staff, and, and some of those models are really nice. And uh, you know, I think I have some patients who are still living at home, and the parents are in their 70s. You know, and that's, that there's, there's, there's not, if someone would become sick or very ill or unable to care for the patient, and there's no plan. And I think there really needs to be a plan for that. So that's something to really start thinking about early on. Um, vocational issues are, are huge, and I, I don't think that in this, in just in the general United States, we don't do as good a job of getting people into vocational state placements as we could. I think there's a lot more that our guys could do that they simply don't have access to. But um, it's really important to 
um, find the right environment for vocational activities. So most of our guys would do better in an environment that's very embracing, that's not overwhelming, where they don't have a lot of direct demands, and where they don't have to interact with a complex job situation with many people, where they have relatively few people who are um, the individuals they're directly interacting with. Most, of, most guys will initially need a job coach, although I do have patients who don't have a job coach anymore. The job coach has been weak because they've really learned to do their job well enough and it really helps if it's something that's an activity of interest you know if they hate doing the laundry and you tell them they have to do the laundry that's just not going to work as a long-term plan if they love shredding paper and they work at paper shredding they're going to be great they're going to shred more paper than anyone else you know ever would do because they're going to be into it and they're going to be getting it done so um, having a job of interest i don't know i can't say how important that is um, the types of jobs that guys that are out of the transition program and working in the community that come to my clinic have are things like they some of them work in fast food i've had a guy who's in i follow a guy who's in his upper 50s who's worked at McDonald's for over 30 years and so you know he's had a very stable placement he does great um, library working in a library some people really like the library because it's quiet and because everything's ordered and you can remember where all the books are and go and stack them um, warehouses I now have at least three or four patients who are either looking at or working in a warehouse and I think th this is there's a lot of lifting and moving stuff around and that's a that there's some sensory element to that that's good the patient doesn't have to sit all day so they're they're moving around and um, also guys Guys with Fragile X have incredible visual memory. They know where these kind of boxes go, and they don't like it when the boxes are in the wrong place, right? So they're going to always have everything in the right place. So that's a, that can be a really good job. And some of them, some, some guys I follow work in a freight yard, which is very similar to the warehouse. They do the same kind of work. Department store, um, one guy who worked at the firehouse, you know, just doing whatever odd jobs the firemen you know did he got to wear the fire equipment you know and that was always very exciting um, shredding office work uh, some people like mail delivery some of the more social people that like to kind of flit around and talk to people you know do something like mail de delivery I have two guys that do landscaping one who even drives the um, lawnmower tractor and does the lawn we had to work a lot on getting all the grass everywhere in the in the place but he he's, he's doing a good job cooking um, a lot of the girls like um, working with kids and so we have an I have quite a number of girls that I follow who are working on being preschool aides or who are already working as preschool aides um, I have one coaches helper um, we've had patients working in the pet store and this is especially good for the kids that really love animals um, swim instructor we had one girl who was a swim instructor and uh, I have one patient who's higher functioning who was a parking garage attendant he parked the cars for you know uh, a parking garage and that he liked doing that um, so this is the vocational place. This is our clinic, and this is what we have in vocational placement for the rush patients who, where we have that data written down, which means the patients who are in forward. Um, so the mo the highest number of patients are still in a day program, and this does tend to be where you wind up going if well, number one, the patients who are lower functioning and are having trouble being trained to do something. Number two, um, it seems to be what happens if no one can find what you're high enough functioning to do a job you do great in your jobs in the transition program but then no one can find there's no placement for you so this is like the default because you don't want the patient home all the time um, workshops are, are pretty we see patients in workshops pretty often um, but I think you know some of the workshops are just not well there's not enough work to do at the workshop so that can be really problematic um, but we do have patients who are in, in, in community employment with supports we have over 20 patients who are doing that and we even have 10 patients who are doing community employment without supports so that's that's really a big goal and then we have some people who are doing nothing which is really not the goal at all and a number of people who are in some additional training program after the transition program to try to get them into a specific program um, a lot of people volunteer and you can do several activities you can have um, you know a, a job that you go to for some hours a week and then also do volunteer activities I think uh, 
keeping busy and having enough hours a week of something to do is, is really important, but it's also really difficult for families because you really have to work on it. The, com the community doesn't make it easy to, to identify these placements. And then another thing I would say is that a less complex environment, um, the guys who find some place to work that's like a mom and pop type of place where, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, a, a gift store or a restaurant or something where there's a there's kind of a family um, business type of attitude where you don't have goals and you don't have all these structures that you have to meet and you don't have pressure and the people just kind of know oh yeah that's you know that's so and so that's what he does and so that you get a little bit more forgiveness and those kind of settings really um, work work better for workplaces it's just that they're hard to find. Um, okay, so how many hours a week do patients work? Um, one of the things when I saw this data come out, I was actually pretty pleased to see that we have a fair number of people who are working 26 to 30 hours a week, and that's really good for Fragile X, actually. Um, and then, of course, we have a smattering of people at all different numbers of hours a week. Um, and often to get to that, you know, the people who are working that number of hours are often working several different jobs that are shorter, that are shorter periods. But um, if they're getting to that, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so adult functioning, adaptive and cognitive. What happens to your thinking and learning functioning after you become an adult? Um, we think that it's pretty stable from about age 20 to age 50, and then once you get past 50, then some of the aging things uh, may kick in. And the truth is we don't know very much about really old aging in Fragile X. Um, some patients may make new gains. Um, and, and in fact, people do learn, the patients do learn new things. They, they may lose old things because they're just not doing those things anymore, um, but they do make new gains. Individuals with Fragile X do need reinforcement. If there's a skill you really want the patient to keep, um, and it's kind of right at the edge of their learning level, you have to keep reinforcing it, otherwise it does tend to get lost. Um, sometimes you have to reteach ADLs until it, until it becomes a habit, and then if you don't, so if you learn to do a certain thing, but then you don't do it for two years, it tends to be where you have to reteach it again. Um, and, and like I said, we can see some loss of academic skills if you're not working on it anymore. So I think that's the key thing is that because of the synaptic wiring problem in the patient's brain, it's harder for patients to maintain mature connections. And so reinforcement is more important throughout the lifespan than in a typical individual. Um, this is a measurement of cognitive change over time, and so um, if we look at these curves, they're pretty flat. Patients perform relatively uh, stably um, over, over the age, at, after the age of six, you know, performance on tests is fairly stable. Um, and then this is, this, this um, graph with the dots on it is a graph of um, performance, of cognitive performance over the years. And of course, um, your ability, and so this is done in developmental age. So this isn't like an IQ where we actually see dropping during the childhood. When you, the developmental age um, on this plot starts at about four or so, and it looks like your developmental age does go up um, until you reach about 20. And then it's probably really stable, even though it looks like a little bit of a downturn. But, but as patients become older, we do start to see um, some regression. And, and exactly how much of that happens and when it starts is something that we really don't know at this point because there haven't been enough patients studied. Um, there are a number of physical and medical problems that we can see in people with Fragile X. Um, we see headaches, stomach problems, issues with sleep, trouble breathing, um, sometimes kind of anxiety um, symptoms with, the, with feeling like chest pressure or, or chest pain, trouble swallowing, muscle cramps, sweating, fast heart rate. Fast heart rate is a feature of Fragile X. You're out, you have a fast heart rate when you go to the doctor, but if we put a vest on you and it measures your heart rate and we put you alone in a room and don't give you any kind of social challenge, your heart rate is still going to be fast. So that's just a feature of the, the Fragile X heart rate is somewhat faster than normal. Um, Medical problems in adolescents and adults with Fragile X that were um, identified in this study from 2015. Um, they looked at all the emergency visits that patients had um, and then tried to look at what was the reason for it. 
Um, and so there were, there's a smattering of seizures. Um, they're probably the mental health visits were the biggest reason for patients having to come to the hospital, that they just had a behavioral outburst or there was something difficult. Most of the rest of the things were um, relatively um, infrequent. So in general, patients with fragile X are pretty healthy. That's been my experience. Um, but there can be certain things that go on. And so toileting regression is one thing that I see throughout the adult span. And this can occur off and on. It's a common complaint over the course of the years. Um, sometimes it's in response to a stress or in response, it can be behavioral, um, but sometimes it's just kind of forgetting the process, basically. And then what you have to do, and so the, you, you want to check for a urinary infection and do a medical evaluation, but um, then you want to go back to a schedule and just put the patient on scheduled toileting, and usually, they, usually that resolves the problem. Um, patients can start bedwetting again. I've had a few patients that started to bedwet in adulthood after having been not bedwetting for many years. And so DDAVP, which is the vasopressin that we use for um, bedwetters in childhood, can be very helpful for um, bedwetting episodes in adults also because they may not be cycling their vasopressin in their brain as well as they should. Um, GE reflux, I think, is a more of a common problem in adults than we actually recognize. We don't, you know, we see, you see it in the babies, the babies that spit up all the time, that's kind of reflux, and then as the babies get older, they don't do it anymore, and then it kind of goes away. My slide. <laughs> um, we may, <laughs> yeah, this is pretty funny. Um, we may, so as adults though, you get these problems, the, the esophageal sphincter, because of the loose connective tissue, tends to be a little loose, and so it's easy to kind of erp stuff up from the stomach up into the esophagus. And so patients may have heartburn, but they may not be able to describe it. It can lead to sleep and behavioral issues. I've had patients that were having a lot of behavior, and we started to notice that it was at certain times during the day relative to eating, and then we put them on antacids, and they were fine after that, you know. So we can even treat behavior with antacids sometimes if there's a lot of reflux and we just don't know that's what's going on um, because the patient can't describe it. Um, cholesterol in Fragile X, this was really interesting. We started doing clinical trials and we hadn't systematically gotten blood work on our patients. And so we did, we, we, as we got these cholesterol levels back because it just happened to be something we were measuring during clinical trials, we discovered that patients with Fragile X have low cholesterol levels. So initially we were focused on the low HDL levels because HDL is the good cholesterol and LDL is the bad cholesterol and their, their HDL levels were quite low and we were like, oh, this may be a heart risk. But then when we looked at it in more detail, um, the LDL levels are also low and so are the total cholesterol levels. So in general, and this, this plot shows data from when we, um, from, from Fragile X compared to the general population, and we have to divide it by age because um, cholesterol is a little bit different at different ages, and so the kids and the adults are on the one side, the kids are in the adolescents are on the one side and the adults are on the other side, and as you can see, the red Fragile X patients are running lower cholesterol levels than the general population. And they're running lower HDL levels. And the HDL levels are a little bit more low maybe than the LDL levels. But what, this, what happens is sometimes if the HDL is more low than the LDL, you get a ratio and the doctors look at the ratio and then they put the patient on cholesterol lowering drugs for a patient that already has very low levels of cholesterol, which makes no sense. But they're doing it because the ratio is considered a cardiac risk factor, and these patients probably really don't need to be on cholesterol-lowering drugs, and those drugs might be having side effects that aren't, that aren't so good. And we may not want to lower the cholesterol in a person with already low cholesterol. Um, okay, we did an aging, we have one aging study in Fragile X. We did an aging study and we found 62 patients over age 40 at Rush, Denver, and UC Davis, and this was now about eight or nine years ago. Um, and what we found was that there seemed to be an increased rate of symptoms of Parkinsonism, um, slowing of motor coordination, and this may be due to the fact that patients have a compensated motor system and they have kind of chronic poor coordination, and then, so when, then when motor abilities start to go downhill as you get older, there starts to be more risk of 
having um, some impairments. And could also possibly do the use of antipsychotics because antipsychotics promote Parkinson's symptoms. And I think older patients do become very much more sensitive to antipsychotics and you have to be more careful with your dose when you're trying to treat behavior in an older patient. Um, we had a high rate of GI problems, a high rate of overweight and obesity, and we've done two studies on this now because we did one out of the Rush Clinic. And it turns out that about 67% of patients with, over, with Fragile X are overweight or obese, but it turns out that's also the CDC percentage of patients in the normal world who are overweight or obese. So they're not really doing any much, they're not doing worse than the typical world. Um, but, you know, it is a problem. And then heart disease and hypertension or high blood pressure were the same as the typical population. Um, we do occasionally see fax tests in Fragile X mosaics. Uh, I, someone with Fragile X who's not mosaic won't develop fax tests, but there seems to be a milder version of fax tests with tremor and Parkinsonism. It's hard to sort out the cognitive change. There are about three cases described, and we really need more information on that to determine who gets it and how mosaic you have to be to be at risk. Um, this is another study of long-term follow-up of, uh, of, the, of the 37 patients in Finland, and they looked at, what, uh, at, at patients who had died during that time period and what they, what they died of. Um, there were a number of patients that got, you know, some, that got, there, were, there were patients with cancer, there, was, there were a couple of cardiac deaths, um, there were a couple of things that were related to an injury of some type, um, status epilepticus in a 65-year-old, a malignancy in a 71-year-old. I, I think this is very anecdotal data, though, and I think we really don't know in the end. We think the lifespan in Fragile X is normal, but we, but we don't totally have the answer to that question. Um, so we, the, we know that Fragile X is associated with a lot of caregiver burden, and basically, you know, if you've got time, you're going to wind up spending more time, time with your child with Fragile X. And we know that um, one of the things that, that is a big problem is caregiver injury, that, that caregivers of individuals with Fragile X are injured frequently, and this is more of a problem in the adults because they're bigger and they can do more damage. Um, and so this is a Don Bailey survey that showed that 31% of caregivers of males and 17% caregivers of, percent of caregivers of females reported at least one injury in a year from their um, from the from the child with the, the patient with fragile X, um, and that 89 percent of the caregivers who reported injury had been injured on the average of 16 times, with 2.7 that required medical care. So that's obviously not everybody. That's the that's the patient. That's just the caregivers who are sustaining injuries. Um, and then this ABC irritability scale that we use in clinical trials all the time to see if we're making patients better was associated with all of these problems with how often you had to go to the doctor, medications, financial burden, family caregiving hours. So clearly, if you have a higher score on that scale, there's a lot more caregiver burden and there's a lot more problems. And it's really the irritability and the tantrums that are causing the problem. Um, okay. Um, so Don also did work on financial and employment burden and found, you know, that there was a significant amount of employment burden in terms of reduced work productivity and financial burden on families. And this is something that I don't need to tell you, but, um, but, but there's a paper. I think the important thing is there's a paper that says this. So if one ever needs to prove this to an organization, um, we, know that, we know that this is a problem. And we know that as a result of having this paper, we can say to granting organizations, look, we have a problem and we need to, you know, we need to work on trying to solve it. Um, financial burden, the median out-of-pocket money that people were spending was, was in Don's study was $1,900. The mean was $17,000. It basically, um, if you had a lot of money, you were spending a lot of money. If you didn't have a lot of money, you weren't spending a lot of money. That was pretty much what he found. So people are just putting their resources into their child with Fragile X, and so this is a huge economic issue. Um, and um, what were they spending it on? Well, mostly medications, therapy, transportation, um, and, you know, to some extent, um, programming, pro other programs. Um, okay, so um, I think, I, so I've kind of gone over what we know about adults, you know, some of it's anecdotal and just data from my clinic and some of it's um, published papers, but you can see we don't have a lot published on it. And so 
what we have started this year, as of now, is the Forward Adult Project, which is going to run in all the FXCRC clinics that see adults. And we have some forms that don't take too long to fill out, but are going to be really important in terms of understanding what are the ADLs that people with Fragile X can do. I mean, there are things like, can they wipe themselves, you know, and stuff like that. So we need to know what are the burdens in adult life, because once we know what patients can't take care of, then we can start, you know, putting in programming and we can talk to agencies about what they should be doing. Um, and so this will provide data to back up public health initiatives and it will identify gaps in care so we can start working on solutions. And um, the other thing we're doing at the level of the FXCRC, and Robbie's been working very hard on this with us, is to find mechanisms for clinics to have options for managing adult fragile X patients because not all the clinics can see adults. And so that, with that, I'm going to finish and acknowledge Megan McCabe, who got all that data from our, went through all of the charts in our Rush Clinic and pulled all that data out the week before this meeting, and Walter and Stephanie, who have been working on the Forward Adult Project, and Jane and Fulcrum, who are really looking at the voice of the patient and what do families need at different stages of Fragile X, from children to adults, and Marsha Braden, who, of course, is the world expert at social behaviors in individuals with Fragile X, including adults. And then all of our adults with Fragile X who come in while well, their parents fill out the forms, but they come into clinic and they tolerate us and they are in our trials and these are just some of my adult patients in clinic. Um, and the thank you slide for everything in Cincinnati.